Hi everyone, uh, my name is Michael Jeffrey. I'm the National Soil Advocate. I was appointed to that uh, position by Julia Gillard a few years ago and that appointment has been extended by various Prime Ministers since. I'm also the Chairman of a group called Soils for Life and this is a group of farmers who are using modern techniques to regenerate the health of their landscapes to achieve a triple bottom line result. Now many of you might be asking yourselves, why is an old soldier and a former vice regal representative taking such a passionate interest in soil, water and agriculture in general? Well, it's because I'm a very worried man. I've got 10 grandchildren and I'm a little concerned that by the time they reach their mid-twenties, they're going to find a world that's going to have a soil, water and food security problem. Why do I say this? Well, the simple fact is that the planet is going to increase its population from about 7 billion to 10 billion by 2050. This means it's got to improve its food production by about 70%. It's going to have to do this when we are losing arable land across the globe at the rate of about 1% per year. It also involves problems in India, China, the Middle East and Sub-Sahara Africa of water availability. Water not just for agriculture but also for drinking. A lot of the water for agriculture in recent years has come from underground aquifers that were established over tens of thousands of years and those aquifers are being rapidly reduced. A number of the world's big rivers are also running short of water, primarily because they're being dammed in the headwaters. Uh, the Mekong in Tibet is a good example which is reducing the flows right down through Vietnam, Cambodia, Laos and so on. Other problem areas occur in the melting of the ice shields in the Himalayas and this is reducing the flows to the Ganges River such that that river might only produce sufficient food for one uh, crop per year as against the current two. Many of the soils in these countries have also been aridified and some cases poisoned. Uh, not a good thing to happen. We're also dealing with the impact of big hot fires right across the Arctic Circle, from example, uh, from eastern Siberia to western Alaska. Methane fires are occurring due to the uh, melting of the ice cap, releasing methane gas and then lightning strikes causing big fires. So all in all across the planet uh, we have lots of soil water problems all impacting on our capacity to grow food. In Australia we have problems too. Uh, we've got a lot of good farmers, we've got a lot of good scientists. But the simple fact of life is that about 60% of our arable land is degraded in some form. About a million kilometres of our rivers and streams are also degraded, mainly because they've been excised by fast running water coming off bare hilltops, taking topsoil with them and then cutting into these stream beds so that they are flowing below the level of the floodplain that they're meant to be supporting. So this is a big issue in itself. Much of our land too, uh, in earlier days, was blowing away through dust storms because we didn't have ground cover on that soil for 12 months of the year. So whilst Australia has its problems in that respect, we also have our solutions. And it's the solutions that I want to talk about in the rest of these uh, few words uh, today. The big key, I think, is to understand that if we're going to have a productive soil, we just cannot look at the soil and its microbial, fungal, nutrient function by itself. We have to look at it in concert 
with the movement of water in the soil, the hydrology, and also in the types of plants that we're growing in the soil itself. And generally speaking, those plants, whether they're crops or grasses or orange trees or what have you, have to be a mixture, a diversity. Monocultures mine the soil, diversity of plants help improve the health of the soil. So if there's one key message to get across today, it's how we successfully integrate the management of our soil, our water, the hydrology and our plants that is key to success. It's true to say that if you mess up one, you also mess up the other two. So each of those three components is dependent upon the good health of the other two. What I want to talk about now is what I'm trying to do as the soil advocate and as chairman of Soils for Life to address that problem of how we're going to better integrate our soil, water and plant assets. I'm taking a three-prong approach. The first is to really define the global imperative of why it is Australia must take real heed of how it's going to look after its landscape and particularly its agricultural landscapes. To do this, we are looking at developing a philosophy for the Prime Minister and other interested people in the policy arenas of the global imperative of why it is Australia should really look after its own soils. I pointed out that imperative in my earlier remarks, but I think it is uh, wise and proper, perhaps twice a year, to put a summary of the whole global water, soil, food production situation to those in leadership positions so that they can see that if the world is in trouble, then Australia is going to feel the impact. Perhaps we'll see if hundreds of millions of people are thirsty or hungry in, uh, in times to come, the social impact that's going to have in terms of uh, national and global uh, security, uh, for example. So developing that global imperative is very important. The second part, or the, or the second plank, if I can put it that way, is to develop a case study picture of leading agricultural farms and stations in this country that can demonstrate to other farmers and graziers how they can better enhance the health of their soils, enhance their productivity, and at the same time improve their environmental and social outcomes. We call this the triple bottom line. And it's very important that we look upon the success of a farm, not just from how much money it's making, although that is important. We've also got to look in terms of, in making of that money, are we also looking after the environment? Are we also looking after the uh, uh, social enhancement? Namely, because mum and dad are now making a dollar and life's pretty good, the kids stay on the farm. Or three or four farms to stay on the land, the local school stays open. That's the social, uh, the social uh, dividend. So with the case studies, uh, we have a situation now. Where we've got 21 of them around the country, most of them uh, in the southeast corner. Uh, my board and I want to roll this out to 100 right around the, the uh, Australia to encompass all agricultural and geographic pursuits. And it's from these 100 leading practice case studies and the promulgation of information and the science of what they are doing that I hope will encourage another 120,000 farmers in this country to follow suit. So we call this fixing the paddock and we have very sophisticated ways now of selecting farms to become part of that trial base and then to measure the performances, the outcomes of productivity, uh, food nutrition, uh, social well-being, and so on, as part of that measuring uh, uh, process. So that's fixing the paddock. But to fix the paddock, I think we've got to go further. I think we've got to have a national philosophy on how we're going to restore and maintain the health 
of the Australian agricultural landscape. It's a very important statement to restore and maintain the health of the Australian agricultural landscape. So what are the key components to a healthy landscape? Well, I mentioned them earlier. They're firstly our soil and its microbial, fungal and nutrient function. Secondly, our water, the hydrology. The water's got to be in the soil to do good. It doesn't do much good just sitting in dams per se or evaporating into the atmosphere, of which 50% of our rainfall now does. Uh, so we've got to look at uh, the, uh, uh, that impact in terms of, of uh, our further uh, development of the case study uh, concept. The second, uh, the second aspect of, of uh, the soil-water-plant combination is to recognise that why these, things are, these three components are so important I believe they should be declared as key national natural strategic assets to be managed accordingly, that is, as key national strategic assets, and very importantly, to be managed in an integrated way. It's the integration that is key. We should then ask ourselves, who is managing most of this landscape? Well, it's 130,000 farmers managing 60% of the Australian continent on behalf of 22 billion urban Australians. And our farmers carry the whole burden, not just to produce the cheapest food, but also to take on the debt burden of fixing their landscapes, whether it's fixing riparian zones or fixing streams or putting trees or planting trees on the ridges or what have you. They carry the whole of that debt burden on behalf of all of us living comfortable lives in cities. And that, I think, is unfair. So in my view, we've got to do two things. We've got to reward our farmers fairly for their produce. And secondly, we've got to reward them for looking after more than half the continent in an environmental sense on our behalf. The third component is then how do we get the Australian urban population reconnected with its rural roots. Well, there are many ways that can do this, but I think one of prime importance is to establish a garden in every junior uh, or every primary and junior high school in the country. A garden where it is not only taught, the kids are not only taught to how to plant a, a, a tomato or a carrot or what have you, but from the age of 5 to 16, they go through a progressive educational program such that by the time a child is 16, he or she has a very good understanding of the basic functions of the soil, photosynthesis, transpiration, water, uh, CO2 removal, all those things, uh, such that the, uh, a child, every child by 16 will then take a real interest in the soil, food, water, uh, no matter whether they're lawyers or doctors or uh, tradesmen or, or what have you. We inculcate a real understanding of how our soil and water and so on function and that everybody realises how important that is no matter what occupation they take on later in life. I think the next key component is to look at our science. We've got a lot of good science in this country, but from my observations, as much of it is penny-packeted. It's all over the place. So firstly, I think we've got to do a stock take on what our science knowledge is in respect to soil, water and, uh, and food, and then decide what the key shortfalls are so that we can refocus our scientific effort on dealing with those key shortfalls in our knowledge. And one of them, I would suggest is our inability today to measure soil carbon levels broad acre quickly, uh, cheaply uh, and reasonably uh, accurately. There are many others but that'll do as a start point. The final ingredient to the policy I think must relate to uh, regulations. We've got to have regulations in respect to how we manage our landscapes. And a key one, I think, 
should be the requirement for anybody who buys landscapes for agricultural purposes, overseas buyers, Australian buyers, is that they must demonstrate an understanding and a willingness to manage that landscape in the methods that I've talked about earlier. What we don't want to have is people buying up large uh, land holdings in this country and then exploiting the landscape for quick profits. So regulatory in that sense, but also regulatory at the local level in terms of how we manage streams, floodplains and so on. So they're the fundamental uh, planks, if I can put it that way, of a national policy to get us all on side in terms of what should be done and working to that aim and using our 100 case studies, fixing the paddock, as the research base because in fixing the policy, you've got to have access to data. And I think our 100 case studies, not by themselves, but certainly as a, a strong component, would over time, perhaps over permanency of time, be able to provide the data that will be needed to ensure that we fully understand what's happening to our soils and water with various, uh, the inputs that we make. So that summarises the policy bit so to uh, complete uh, this little chat, let me, let me just uh, try and uh, pull that all together. What we're on about, I think, is to recognise the importance of our soil, water and plants in terms of integrating their management to restore our agricultural landscapes to good health and keep them that way. We've got a three-pronged approach to develop a global imperative that gets governments here really working to do the best we can in Australia, not just to increase our food production a little bit, even if we doubled our food production, we could feed 60 to 80 million people, that's all. But if we were to export the knowledge that we gain from all these leading practice farmers, we may well help to feed a billion people and that would make a very big difference uh, to the social, global social cohesion and Australia would be seen as a country of real worth in being the leaders in uh, developing and exporting that knowledge. So to all of you involved in the uh, forum in the coming days and the Carbon Farm Forum in particular, uh, may I wish you uh, every success in your deliberations. Carbon, of course, is a key ingredient uh, of the soil for uh, soil health. Uh, we have been losing our soil carbon steadily since uh, the development of agriculture in this country. And of course, with the loss of soil carbon, we also impinge greatly on our capacity to hold water in the soil. So I hope that uh, your forum will uh, demonstrate uh, the importance of soil carbon and if you can work out some ways of quickly measuring uh, those soil carbon levels uh, fairly accurately, quickly and uh, broad acre, uh, then you'll do the planet a great service. All the best to you and thanks for listening.